Uh, beautiful, yeah. So, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about pencils, and we're gonna talk about carbon. So, so hopefully, I'm gonna I'm gonna motivate um, why kind of using carbon as a common way to think about your data center is gonna um, make your your data center more happy and save the world. So, um, here's my pencils. Um, so, so what, what I'm going to propose or what I'm going to try to motivate here, um, kind of the last few years of my experience in, um, in sustainability, but really my you know, 20 plus years of, of engineering experience. And so there's a lot of different colors here, a lot of different ways that things can be measured in your data center, a lot of things that matter. Um, but I'm going to try to motivate that if we can reduce them down to kind of carbon footprint, then that'll be a great way to optimize your data center kind of in two ways. And so I was told many years ago um, to put your, um, your conclusion up front and, and don't make people wait. So, so this is my conclusion. So my conclusion or proposal is that if um, you look at the carbon footprint of what you're doing in the data center, so the energy consumed in the data center, as well as the energy that was used for the inputs in the data center, and I'll talk about that at some length, kind of scope three. But if you use what is the current carbon footprint of your data center, and you make you look at how can I reduce the carbon footprint, then there will be a lot of ways to reduce the carbon footprint, most likely. Um, and the good news is this is not like solar power or electric cars, where you have to invest more or spend more, and then you get this benefit down the road. This benefit is immediately obvious. And if you reduce the carbon footprint, you're going to reduce your cost. So that means from the point of view of a data center operator or, or someone paying for all the various pieces of the data center, you're gonna reduce the carbon footprint, which is good for the planet, but you're also gonna reduce the cost footprint, which is good for your bottom line, right? So this is, is not um, kind of a trade-off, this is all in better. And that's what I hope to motivate. Um, I, um, SW kind of recruited me or dragooned me onto the stage here um, as, after I gave a talk at um, the Mass Storage Technology um, Conference um, a few months ago over in Santa Clara. Um, there's a longer intro in that talk if you want to look at these slides so you can click through, but I'm not going to give kind of longer intro of, of uh, long-winded ways of um, my pathway through storage and, and all the things I've seen, but I've, I've seen some stuff, right? But I want to give just one um, example of when I joined EMC um, in 2008, the problem I was given um, to, to kind of optimize the hardware team was, um, was this system. So the, what we were building was an object storage system that was going to be sold or was being sold on dollars per terabyte. Right? And dollars per terabyte was a great metric for us because we could optimize this from an engineering perspective. And so that meant I had a rack, um, I had to put disk drives in this rack, I had to connect all these disk drives together and eventually hook them up to an ethernet interface so that someone could send a REST API. But the optimization factor for us was this entire rack. So we got well-formed um, REST API requests in the top of this rack as ethernet packets and whatever we did inside the rack was completely up to us. So that means that from an engineering perspective, we could do not only hardware co-design with all the components that are in here, but also hardware um, software co-design with. We determine the file systems that we put on these drives. We determine the protocols that were used between the servers. So this gave us an incredible amount of, of freedom of action to optimize this metric, right? And so dollars per terabyte was our headline metric. But remember I said this was 2008. So 2008 was the early days of cloud, right? So I remember sitting in a, in a boardroom meeting with Joe Tucci and uh, he's like, you mean that like the Amazon, like the book guy, like we're gonna compete with the book, what, what is going on? So, so this was the early days of cloud, right? But we were already starting to talk about, and this is what the cloud gave us, right? Dollars per terabyte per month. So not just the upfront cost of how much was I gonna pay for the storage system when I bought it, but what was the all-in ongoing cost? And I'm gonna propose that this has proven true over the last 15 years, basically, um, certainly 10 plus years, that um, if you look at the all-in costs of what you're doing, you can get a much better end result than if you just look at the purchase cost ongoing, right? So what was our optimization model here? 
we had to put, um, so dollars per terabyte, right? So that means that the more terabytes I could put on each drive, and the more drives I could put in the rack, the higher my terabytes, right? And the less overhead I had, the less of these pesky servers and then all these cables and backplanes and, and chassis and pieces of sheet metal and so on, um, the better off I was going to be because all those other things just add to the dollars and they did nothing for the terabyte, right? So every piece of overhead I added was going to increase the dollars but not do anything for the terabyte. So what did we do? We looked around, you know, different enclosures. This is what was going on at the time, right? Black Backblaze was here um, yesterday, I think, giving a talk, right? Maybe folks know their, you know, very bare, bare sheet metal red enclosure. But there's lots of different systems, you know, the ubiquitous kind of 2U12, um, Supermicro had a neat system for a while where you had the disk drives in the front and in the back. So you had to walk to the hot side to get the disk drives. Um, SGI introduced this idea of trays. Those trays are going to come up again um, where you mounted the drives. Um, and we had this back to back, right? And, and so what we did is we looked at how else can we rearrange the physicality of this, right? And um, worked with, um, with some of the enclosure suppliers and ended up with this configuration that's now basically ubiquitous in, in high density storage, right? Disk drives in, a to in what we unfortunately call the tombstone configuration, right? So the drive is put into the enclosure, the weight of the drive pushes it down onto the connector. So you don't need fancy brackets, braces, and so on. You have minimal sheet metal um, protecting the drives and you're still meeting all of the engineering CTQs of those drives, right? That brought us up to, sorry, I didn't mention the metric. So the metric on the, where we started was um, eight, eight and a half drives per U. This system brought us to 14. We eventually had another enclosure that, um, that um, had, uh, HCST helped us um, kind of innovate with that was 22 drives per U, right? So in that system, we put 800 drives into a rack. We used in our densest configuration just four servers to, to get enough redundancy. We were doing, oh, sorry, we were doing redundancy in software, right? So compared to my other architect friends at EMC, you know, they were like, you know, gold plating, platinum plating things. No, 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 we couldn't afford any of that, right? This was silver plated at best, right? We didn't do dual pathing. We didn't do um, various things. We used software erasure coding across the ethernet, SATA drives, high density. Um, we you know, experimented some of these systems, at least at the experimental level. We even did zones before zones were cool, right? So um, 800 drives, four servers, two switches, 18 cables. So each of the servers had two cables to the one, the two switches, and um, one cable to the JBOD, right? So minimal, minimal in the design, right? And one of the big reasons we could do this is because we were end-to-end -end optimizing, right? We didn't need to interoperate with hundreds of different ways to do it, all different kinds of arrays and servers and HBAs and multipath and all this stuff, all the stuff that my other architect friends at EMC, they're like, oh, Eric's life is so much easier because all he has to do is put some drives, right? Um, this allowed us to be, at least at EMC, we were the first group to use um, eight terabyte drives. Use helium drives, right? Everyone's like, oh my God, Eric's gonna use those helium drives. What's gonna go crazy? Like, they were twice as much capacity as the drives we were using. Of course we were gonna use them, right? So we used tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of those, right? So we built several exabytes of this in two generations of products. We then iterated again. We ultimately did, I guess, seven generations of hardware between these two platforms, put a bunch of exabytes out, right? By being able to do this end-to-end -end optimization, reduce, 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 because we had our dollars per terabyte per month. And you know, a couple of exabytes that we put out into the world kind of were child's play compared to what was done in the cloud space, right? GFS was built on these same principles, the original kind of big, big shift from the GFS paper um, when it was presented in the research community was they were gonna break the, the API that was given to applications, right? So we weren't gonna be backwards compatible with what a file system expected because they wanted this efficiency in all the layers. And that folds down into all the layers. Colossus still built like that. Okay, so now hopefully I've motivated kind of end-to-end -end motivation, do more with less because you have a metric to optimize, right? But I said I was gonna talk about carbon, so let me talk about carbon, all right? 
my pencils. Um, it turns out I was actually exposed to um, environmental thinking or carbon thinking actually very early in my career. So my first um, job in grad school was actually with the Electric Power Research Institute um, here in California. I put this map up because I eventually recognized this building when I kept visiting VMware. We were helping them with their um, cloud service. And then at some point I'm like, wait, this looks familiar. And it turned out, you know, I just turned left instead of turned right on this road. And there was this um, uh, it, place where I, um, I did my first consulting gig um, kind of 30 years ago, right? And the similarly in SNEA, so here's a slide from um, SDC in 2009, um, where um, SW, myself, you know, small group, uh, Leah, um, who's here, you know, small group, half a dozen um, folks, maybe uh, ultimately, you know, grow to um, two dozen. Um, created the green um, initiative within SNIA, it's still running today, right? And we were looking at the power efficiency of, um, of storage systems, right? Um, the guy that we talked to from Energy Star, he was so excited. It's a guy named Andrew, Andrew Fanara, was so excited to deal with us. He had just finished optimizing Energy Star for um, refrigerators, the coolers where you get um, water, water cooler, so on. And he's like, oh my God, it was so terrible. We just you know, said like, what are you talking about? There's a hot pipe and a cold pipe and like you a little bit of insulation. What do you, what? And so he's like, and then when we started explaining to him about how storage worked, he's like, oh my gosh, there's so many different avenues. You guys can do so much, right? And that's what we've been doing, right? There's so many ways to optimize the energy consumption of your storage system that this has been, you know, 15 years worth of work, all right? But it's not just energy, right? There's a lot of resources that go into our computing, right? A lot of um, kind of fancy metals, things that have to be brought out of the ground, right? I was at Seagate um, during the great ruthenium shortage, right? How many people knew there was a great ruthenium shortage? Yeah, there was, right? Um, it, uh, it has to be brought deep out of the ground. There's a lot of metals that have to be brought deep out of the ground, right? So there's a lot of, um, of underlying resources. And, and I'm taking a small shortcut in that it isn't all carbon, right? Some of it is ruthenium and copper and, and tin and so on. Um, but you can, you can normalize a lot of that to carbon, right? How much carbon does it take to extract the ruthenium um, from the ground? And you can still get pretty close. So kind of carbon equivalence is, is really what I'm saying, but, but hopefully you'll, um, you'll pardon me the, um, the rounding, right? And so the important thing, and the thing that um, I was introduced to about five years ago um, when I um, was, was dragged into, when I um, joined um, IT Renew, is you want to look at this number. So this is my second slide of bringing the conclusion up front, right? And so in a typical server scenario, 70, more than 75% of the lifetime carbon of a piece of computing equipment has been expended before you plug it into the wall for the first time, right? And then we have in this um, example here, 22% is all the energy consumption while it's running in your data center, right? And then there's a couple percent that's spent kind of after it leaves the data center when, I, when um, you know, minimal, right? As, as you deal with that, right? But 76% but in the upfront case, right? But if you think about this for just a few minutes, right? This is highly sensitive to what you're actually gonna do with the server. So this is if you run the server for three years. If you run the server for six years or nine years, then that operational phase becomes much higher. And it, and it, it, it pushes out, you know, amortizes that pre-use phase, right? Um, and so that's what we're gonna motivate in the next couple slides. So what we did at IT Renew, when I joined IT Renew, we, we fit, folded into something that's in, in the general world is called the circular economy, which is basically extending the supply chain, extending the lifetime um, of systems, right? And so this is, this is Ali Fenn, my former boss at, at IT Renew. She kind of, kind of motivated this. Um, she was also involved in object storage. So we had kind of a bit of a history through, through SNEA and so on. Um, she ran the Kinetic program at, uh, at Seagate, if people remember that. But the important motivation was that so much energy, <laughs> no pun intended, had been spent optimizing that operational phase, right? Reduce the energy consumption, but very little, uh, in, um, attention had been paid to the upfront cost. And the numbers here are huge. 
So this is from a presentation at OCP in 2019, and it was motivating in the next four years, so 2019 through the, lap, the previous four years now, right? So there were 65 million servers in data centers, and there were gonna be 14 million additional servers deployed over the following four years. So the logical thing is, okay, that right now, there should be 120 million servers in data centers. But it turns out that's not the case. It's a little bit lucky because it would use even more um, energy footprint. But so it turned out the number, um, the expected number was more like 75, which meant that almost 50 million servers would be brought off the data center floor and create basically e-waste, right, in that same time period, right? And this is what that looks like. So this is the IT Renew processing facility in Kansas. Um, this is about 600 racks, each with um, 30 or 40 servers in it. So this is 15,000 servers that are on their way to the e-waste pile. All right. um, when in the time that, um, that I was with IT Renew, IT Renew processed between 25,000 and 125,000 servers per month. So those servers that you see, that's about a month's worth of uh, processing, right? Those servers are delivered in 53-foot um, um, trucks um, filled with racks of, of servers. The good thing is the entire truck is filled with racks, so you don't even have to protect the racks or anything like that. They're just right next to, they're so close to each other that they don't even move in the truck, right? So it's nice and efficient from a logistics point of view. And a little shake, rattle, and roll, right? As, as Mark said, yeah, we can, we can handle that. Right? Um, we're going to throw it out anyway, a lot of it, right? And then this is what it looks like at the edges of that room, right? And I want to point out just that, that third photo there. So what that um, cardboard um, container there says, in a very um, thick cardboard, is it says net, net weight not to exceed 750 pounds. That container is 750 pounds worth of transceivers. So there are 700 pounds of little tiny lasers in that bin. And you don't know how many times I tried to convince the people, like, do you know how much you get to right? They're like, Eric, look at this. Look at how many there are. Like, this one's red, and this one's green, and this one's wide one, and a thing. And I, I, like, I spent a, a weekend in, the, in this facility because of some, some unfortunate decisions that someone made at the end of a quarter. And so I, I took a couple hundred out, and I put them on a big piece of cardboard. And I'm like, look, guys, it's simple, right? These are wide, right? These are thin, right? These have, have the, you know, if it says, if it has B-A-D in Sharpie on, the, like, don't use that one. Put that one back. Right? And, and they're like, Eric, you don't understand. Like, this is two weeks worth of, right? And so the, the biggest problem in this processing and in these facilities is the sheer complexity writ large of everything that we've built, right? And trying to tease that out at the back end, right? And so that's what we, what we did. Um, oh, and then, um, sorry, I had, um, SW said I had to do a shout out. So um, I'm going to do a shout out to these sessions tomorrow. One of the reasons this can be done, right, remember that when these racks come in, they still have their disk drives in them and their flash drives. Um, these come from consumer companies, a lot of them, right, or corporations, wherever it is, but there's sensitive data on these drives. So the first thing that's done is the drives are removed. Right? Um, a lot of them have actually already been sanitized in the data centers by software, but nobody trusts that, so they're also crushed. Right? And so in the corner of this facility, there's a big, big crusher machine. Luckily, it wasn't working on the day that I interviewed, or else I might never have taken this job. You know, seven years at Seagate, and they're crushing them. Right? Um, but that's what we do. Um, I also was supposed to shout out um, JM um, from um, Chia. He's been trying to work with the companies that force I renew to shred these drives. So if, if you can give, um, you know, let JM tell you the story about why you shouldn't shred your drives and why it's safe, go listen to, to Eric and, uh, and the crew uh, tomorrow about why it's safe to not shred your drives. Don't shred your drives, it's bad, all right? Um, so, so that's what that is, right? And then I'm not gonna go into all of the economics, but so then basically with the economics of IT Renew, so IT Renew had relationships with, with many of the largest hyperscalers, right? And, and that's how it became to be, you know, 50,000, 100,000 servers per month. And the, the goal of IT Renew was to put that material back into the supply chain, right? And so the way that we did that, that my team did that, is by building fully integrated racks. 
And we built racks of servers, storage, and networking. And our commitment to customers, our pitch to customers was, if we can use 85% or 90% material from that big warehouse that's otherwise gonna go to e-waste, we can give you um, performance equivalent systems for 50% hard dollar savings at a minimum, right? And we were still paying for the guys who are taking it all apart and engineers and all that stuff, right? So at good margins, we were giving people 50% hard dollar savings compared to what they would do otherwise with no compromise, right? And so how did we do this? By looking at the workloads of what was done. Oh, I'm sorry. So these are five racks. Um, they're still running today um, in Dallas, Texas, right? Um, this is um, OCP equipment. We did it with OCP equipment. There's a bunch of reasons for that. It's open, it's collaborative, right? There's good reasons, but it doesn't have to be, right? Um, we happily lifted CPUs out of HP servers and put them into the, the fancy OCP servers. Um, we, you know, to Samsung's credit, right? We lifted DIMMs out of anything. DIMMs are completely interchangeable. Um, uh, or with, uh, with just a little bit of effort. Um, so, so what we were trying to do with all that is increase the operational phase, right? Keep the systems running longer, right? And the, the way we did it at IT Renew was we had a set of, of clients, folks who were sending us this equipment. The equipment was on average between two and a half and three and a half years old, sometimes older, sometimes a little bit newer. There's a lot of reasons. And so we were trying to facilitate this second use, right? Who's gonna use the equipment for years four through six, right? But it turns out that the trick is just to use the equipment longer, right? So you could just keep the equipment longer in its primary use and also get the same benefit, right? The role that IT Renew plays is simply to facilitate the second user of those components and potentially a third user. But the most important thing from an engineering perspective is all of these components, certainly at the component level, but even at the system level, are designed for nine years, 10 years, 12 years, right? And, and those of you who have engineered these systems know that this is the case, right? Anyone who's ever worked at EMC knows that this is contractually possible, right? When we built those um, rack-based systems, even our object storage systems that were competing with the book guy, right? We committed a 10-year service life of those systems. And we committed our suppliers to a 10-year supply life. Right? Yeah, the guys at Arista didn't want to support the same operating system on the same switch for 10 years, right? They wanted like five years, seven years. Like, nope, it's written into the contract, right? So what do they do? They put a few more switches on the shelf. They have a few engineers who kind of pay more attention to, to the repos and so on. And it turns out there is no reason for any of the components at a lifetime level that they can't last nine years at least, if not 10 or 12 years. So therefore, we can do this thing where we can, whoops, we can um, reduce the carbon footprint by increasing the, the operational life and therefore amortizing all that upfront kind of piece and you can save cost. So this is a storage conference. So I brought you a, a worked example of some of the things we're able to do by just being a little bit creative with this extra constraint of, if I can use a part that I already have tens of thousands of, then I'm better off than if I have to design something new. So I'm gonna tell a, a, a disk story, right? So this is um, the drive enclosure um, we had. Again, we used OCP a lot. So this is kind of the, um, in, the, in the time frame of the systems we were dealing with, this is something called a Knox enclosure. It's 30 drives in a 2U shelf, right? Um, the server is, is separate um, from this, right? So it's a JBOD. Um, the server is, is one third of, of a U, sorry, it's actually two thirds of a U. Um, there's a bunch of details I can talk about, but I, I made a storage example. So um, 2.3 U for 30 drives. And then customers constantly wanted us to compete with a 2U12 because a 2U12 is what's standard in the industry, right? So the good news is I can put 12 drives into my 30 drive enclosure and I can provide them what they want. It's just a little bit bigger for HDD. But then people wanted SSDs, right? And so if I do SSDs, okay, 
I can do it, right? So I can take my three and a half inch slot and my um, SAS connector, um, or sorry, SATA connector in the SAS backplane. I can put a two and a half inch SSD drive onto it, right? It talks to the HBA that's in that server, right? It all works, right? It gives for many CTQs exactly maybe what people want. So I've now gone from 7,000 IOPS to 2 million IOPS by having um, SSD, by having flash instead of HDD, right? Um, my watts per IOP is plummeted, right? Because I have this, this massive IOPS, right? My watts per terabyte isn't great, but maybe that's not what I was doing, right? I wasn't doing archive storage, right? But like, can we do something a bit better here? And so it turns out, that we could, because since the time that that JBot had been designed, right, the, the industry had evolved. Remember, all the drives are crushed before I get any of this equipment. So I have to buy new drives anyway. So why am I buying these SATA drives and these tiny little containers and putting them in the thing? Why don't I just get NVMe drives? And if I'm gonna get NVMe drives, maybe I can even simplify that. I don't even need the case and all this thing, right? So I just use an M.2 drive. And so this thing is called a, an Ava board. It's a four drive um, by 16 PCI card. And it just brings four PCI lanes to each one of these four NVMe drives. No controller, no SATA, no SAS, no cables, no nothing. I'm just putting the flash chips right onto the, the bus um, with everything else, right? And we just heard how great an idea that was right, in the previous presentation, right? And now, by also using higher density drives, I'm able to do, um, instead of the 29, I'm only able to do 25 terabytes. But then it turned out um, one of our engineers realized there was actually on this back plane, we have a by 16 slot and then we have a by eight slot. And it turns out if you put, this thing is so simple. If I put, if I only light up eight of these 16 lanes, then two of the drives light up because it's not doing anything. There's, there's, there's no rewriting, there's no unpacking of the packets, right? All it's doing is passing the traces onto these drives. So as a result, we were able to put six of these NVMe drives directly on the by 24 lanes that we had. And now we have, a, again, a 24 terabyte instead of 29 terabyte. And again, I have 2.4 million IOPS. So if what the customer wanted was 2.4 million IOPS and 20 odd um, terabytes of capacity, I had now done it in um, one fifth the space, right? And with so much less sheet metal, cables, et cetera, higher bandwidth, right? So I've used my kind of carbon footprint to simplify and optimize, right? And of course, since this is storage, you know, the zone guys are still here. Um, if you want a lot of density, a lot of bytes, if you're doing archival storage, by all means, put 18 terabyte drives into this JBOD, and we, we did that as well, right? Now you're, you're back down to 7,000 IOPS, ooh, sad. Um, but you've got um, half a petabyte, Right, and then um, you know in the same time frame, um, you know the OCP project also created a larger JBOD, and now we're back to the JBOD where I was, kind of five years earlier. Right, Tombstone put the drives in the JBOD. Now there's 72 drives, 1.3 petabytes. Right, and now that I've built out this entire table, you see, as you can appreciate, as a storage audience the complexity of what I've done because there is an incredible dynamic range of performance and, and um, capacity characteristics, right? I have two million IOPS. I have um, a tenth, or what is that, a three, three hundredths of a watt per IOP in that NVMe system versus 37 watts if I'm running the HDD. And, but I also have um, you know, the watts per terabyte, half a watt per terabyte up to 11 watts per terabyte, right? So sometime, there's, there's several times there's an order of magnitude. A couple of times there's two orders of magnitude in what you're doing with the system, right? And we're having the same components run across this entire gamut, right? And so if we can optimize for what the workload wants, then we can reduce and we can simplify. If we have to just accept the whole range of workloads, we end up with these in-between kind of solutions, right? And so it's kind of the, the engineering pitch here is that if we just look at the components we have, 
we can do um, much better, and this is what's gonna lead in your, in your data center, right? So, oh, sorry. So then as a result, our mainstream offering to customers was two solutions. So if someone wanted Flash, I gave them NVMe drives um, in, in the server. Um, if they wanted more than 25 terabytes, I sold them two servers, right? Um, if they wanted um, high density, then I gave them a, a, a JBOD with the Bryce Canyon, right? Um, I actually noticed there's a talk here on the follow-on to this Bryce Canyon, the Grand Canyon design you can listen to right after lunch, right? This applies not just in storage. Of course, I made a storage example. This applies also in memory, right? I can put a 64 gig DIMM into exactly the same slot that an eight gig DIMM fits in. The, memory, uh, the power consumption is a little bit less than twice, right? And it's eight times as much memory, right? What application doesn't run better with eight times as much memory in the same system, right? Similarly with networking, um, we had, because of the way we were getting the materials, we had 25 gig by default. People be like, Eric, can I, can I do cheaper? If I do 10 gig, I'm like, if you want, you can plug in the 10 gig cable, it turns out it works. Um, but I'm, I'm selling you a 25 gig NIC because that's what I have. Right? I have 100,000 uh, 25 gig NICs, so that's what we're gonna put in. Right? And just in case you're like, oh, but what about AI and Moore's Law? So I have a little table here where I have um, two CPUs, or sorry, um, yeah, two CPUs and then four um, uh, GPUs. And the thing I wanna point out is that fourth item down, that K80, right, a GPU from 2014 is still faster than any CPU at doing AI workloads, right? So this is an AI score, there's a, a benchmarking um, kind of tool. Um, so it, it, it arrivals that, um, that Samsung Galaxy, right? Which is, which is a great statement on something, right? Um, but what's important is that that, or sorry, what's, so, so that's your carbon footprint, right? So if you're doing AI processing, it makes sense to use that nine-year-old GPU and don't use like a latest Xeon, whatever. It just doesn't make any sense, right? And we all know that, right? Just like you don't use um, CPUs to do Bitcoin, right? You buy an ASIC, right? Um, but then the second part, remember the white part of my chart is the cost, right? And so if you take the street price of, um, of that top uh, GPU, the $3,600, and you spend it on the other stuff instead, then we can beat um, the, um, the, the much, much newer GPU um, on a dollars basis because I can get you into a K80 for uh, $200, right? And if you take um, enough 280s to, you know, 18 of them to get that $3,600, then you have more than 100,000 of these AI operations. And by the way, this is being done to you on the cloud right now. Google will rent you a K80 on the cloud for $200 a month. I'll get, find you a $200 K80 and you can rent it to people for $200 a month and keep the money for yourself, right? Um, I'm not slagging off the cloud providers in any way, right? The book guys, they're good, right? So um, carbon footprint, reduce the carbon footprint, increase the efficiency by focusing on the end user workload that you get for all of the carbon inputs that will allow you to, to reduce the footprint of what you're doing or be much more um, performant or, or efficient, right? Um, and it's also gonna save you in cost, right? I have a lot of comparisons on, on the things, so I'm not gonna go into all these details. I had to make one more shout out because SW told me I had to. So there's a BOF um, tonight on long-term storage, right? Um, a lot of this was motivated yesterday. Um, Christian um, from, from Cerebite, kind of work with what you have. If you're gonna keep storage for 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, a lot of what I said just you know, magnifies itself out over time. And um, there were a number of sessions yesterday that looked at that, right? In the storage space, long-term storage is a great way to think about the carbon footprint of what you're doing. I'm not gonna tell you about uh, Um and I'm not gonna tell you about um, Freon, the Freon guys. So I'm gonna thank you um, for listening and I'm gonna take um, a, oh, no, six minutes. I'm gonna take six minutes worth of questions. And I, and I, made, I, already, sent, I already sent it to Arnold, I'll update it with you know, kind of the things. So you can read through, you can go read through about Catadores, uh, it's very, very um, interesting in the motivation. You can cut through about the Freon guys. So there's a couple of guys that drive around in a truck and buy up Freon 
um, all over the country. Um, and then they um, burn it up and the state of California pays them um, millions of dollars to buy up Freon with cash and burn it up, right? Um, so that's, my, that's a story that's embedded in there. But I, I wanna take some questions. So, questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so, we, so in, fact, in fact, we do that. Um, so, so I, oh, 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 I'm sorry, Let me repeat the question. Um, that wasn't just the thing people do, um, it's because he says so. Um, so the, the question was the, the componentry, right? So how do you separate the componentry in a, for example, a flash drive and put it back into different parts of the, of the supply chain, right? So um, the, the bad news is that almost all the drives just go in a crusher and it all gets crushed together and then it's all just a big hunk of thing and nothing good happens. But it turns out that some enlightened um, clients are like, hey, there's some value, you know, we already scrubbed the drives or we had encryption to begin with. It's okay if you want to reuse it, right? And so what we do for some of those customers is um, we lift the flash chips off the, um, the, the board, right? So you have this controller board, right? Um, controller board is limited, right? Software is terrible. That's why you need software enabled flash because whatever is burned into that controller, <laughs> right? So take away the board. Now you have the bare flash chips. You put the f bare flash chips back into the thing, right? Now you've done probably, I mean, you've done basically 100% or close to 100% of the economic value and the, the scrap value, kind of the carbon value, maybe you've gotten to 80% and so on. Right? But that my ex point exactly is if you think about how are we doing with all of that, it leads you to what is the efficient thing to do, right? How much energy does it take for me to lift the flash chips off um, and so on, right? Similarly, if I wanna reball the, the, the CPU, if I need to lift off, a socketed CPU is easy, right? You just unscrew the heatsink, take off the CPU, right? If, um, if it's soldered onto the board, I need to undo the solder. There's some cost to doing that, but we can calculate all that, right? Okay, what else? Yeah. Yes. 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 So, yes. So we took that into account. So. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to repeat the question. So, so the, the um, processors you know, have different efficiencies, right? New processors are more, the, the word was a lot, but it's not a lot, but it doesn't matter. New processors are more efficient than old processors. Do we take that into account in our kind of scope three in our calculations? And so we do. So our positioning with customers was performance normalized 50% savings. So that means if the part that I was putting in was only a quarter as performant as the part that you were comparing against, I would sell it to you for one eighth the cost of what you had. So on a cost basis, we normalized that out completely, right? On a carbon basis, it's a little bit unfair because basically anything that causes me to not send it to the landfill is good. Right? So that means that I sh could, should lower my price to like an absolute minimum number just to get someone to use it and not send it to landfill. Right? But if you just take that performance into account, um, we dealt with that. Right? And it turns out there's very few components that with three or four years on them actually have any kind of 50% you know, or 70% or power reduction. It's usually 15 or 20%. And that's the critical point is if you use that carbon calculation and that end user CTQ, then you'll be able to follow the data on that and you'll always make a good decision, right? You won't by mistake use an inefficient component to do something um, because you're taking all of the carbon into perspective, right? Okay, maybe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so do these systems fail more and does that need to be taken into account? And so it turns out now I've been doing this for way too long. And so I happen to know from lived experience of selling hundreds of thousands of disk drives, and disk drives are terrible, right? They spin, they're mechanical and all this stuff. The failure rates are so tiny, right? The failure rates in our experience at EMC, 80% of the failures that people called about were software problems. Right? They forgot their password. They weren't doing the REST API right. The IP address, you know, they didn't have enough dots in the IP address. Right? Of the remaining 20% that crossed my desk, oh, there's hardware problems. Eric, we gotta replace these drives, whatever, right? Three quarters of those problems were just software problems masquerading as hardware problems, right? The number of hard drives that I replaced from a population of several hundred thousand was tiny, right? And it was barely, almost imperceptibly worse at year four than it was at year one, and that's hard drives, right? And so flash drives, very similar pieces, right? So the important thing is that the systems are maybe incrementally more failure, but it's a small percentage, and that means that the redundancy that we've put in, the erasure coding, all the conservatism that's built into it can take care of those failure rates. Right? We found nothing where the failure rate goes from 1% AFR to 10% AFR because it's five or six years old. Right? The only time we found it was this, we have a customer in Texas that runs their systems in an open, they open the garage doors of Texas and they let the dust of Texas through. And so their fans get clogged with dust. And so we've replaced the fans. Right? So the important thing being that the amount of design and design conservatism and testing and so on that's built in gives such a wide margin that in practice, there's no difference at years four through six than there is at years one through three. Right? Okay, I guess one final, I don't know who's in charge, but you're in charge. So he's taking me off. So I'm here, um, I'm here all day. Um, feel free to talk to me. Um, feel free to find me online. So I'm kind of ER1P um, everywhere. It's a, a email address that was assigned to me uh, years ago, but um, find me um, and I'm happy to talk. Oh, right, and come to the BOF, right? Long-term storage BOF, thanks everybody.